As a Japanese American, I'm interested in the Far East. And now I'm going to get the chance to see a lot of that history come alive. Well, I've always been interested in Marco Polo, but what really got me and deepened my intrigue was reading an article questioning whether he uh, actually made it to China or not. He sailed 40,000 miles across the South China Seas and the Indian Ocean. The only way I can truly understand these great voyages is to make them myself and get a taste of the world that Zheng He and his crews must have experienced 600 years ago. I've been here at least a half a dozen times and every time I come here I'm just totally blown away by the scale. For sure you don't want to shoot where everybody else shoots. Photography is not about equipment. What photography is really about is vision. 2,000 monks. It's as like nothing has changed here in 700 years. This is the moment you live for. The Great Wall from beginning to end. The Great Wall of China is among the few works created by human hands that exceed the descriptive power of language. Everything about the wall staggers the imagination, its 4,000 mile length, the incalculable amount of materials and human labor it took to build, and the time it took to complete 1,800 years. Extending across deserts, Seeming to defy gravity as it rises up mountainous terrain, or just walking is a challenge. It is difficult to understand how this immense civil engineering project was carried out using only the most rudimentary tools and materials. It is a monument to mankind's ambition that has not and may never be surpassed in terms of scale and sheer audacity. It is unique in human history. Just more, right? Iconic, big subjects on China, you know, the Silk Road, Marco Polo, Sea Silk Road, Cha Ma Down, Great Wall. In comparison, uh, well, I had a great time shooting the Great Wall. Uh, 
It's a classic landscape uh, story. My challenge, of course, is shooting a place that has been photographed a billion times before, and so that's always a challenge to come up with something new and different of uh, an iconic landscape. And um, plus, I was working with Pete Hessler, one of the best uh, writers today and the concept was to drive the wall that's what he wrote about is he well we were both driving the wall people have walked the wall run the wall but nobody no foreigner at least has driven the wall he was the first and that as a foreign correspondent uh, to be driving you know in a car rent a car uh, along the wall became a funny kind of thing and in the end he ended up writing a book called Country Driving which is now a bestseller half of which is devoted to his driving he and I driving on the Great Wall so um, it was a challenge also in just finding the Great Wall a lot of research to find out where it actually went because uh, there are many sections of the wall especially up in uh, Mongolia that uh, uh, no longer exist except as a road or uh, a lump that you see kind of making a fine line through uh, the grasslands and there are anyway I can show you some funny examples of the wall uh, that people find hard to believe because I'll show a piece of a uh, wall that's part of somebody's house or a piece of the wall that's now become a a uh, lavatory to toilet or a piece of the wall that just is sitting by the side of the road and has no purpose but it is actually the Great Wall so the Great Wall of China over 2,000 years old over 4,000 miles long it's been built and rebuilt by countless ruling dynasties how come Marco Polo never mentions it in his book it's here in Jiayuguan that the mystery of Marco Polo starts to fall apart. As any China scholar can tell you, it was this wall, this 10 foot high maybe mud wall that Marco Polo saw when he traveled through here uh, in 1275. Now this wall is the Han Wall. Uh, built somewhere around 8200 just pretty much a lump wandering through the desert and uh, I, if I was Marco Polo I wouldn't have paid it a second glance especially after the walls that he saw and commented on in places like BAM in Iran the world's biggest citadel the Great Wall in his day was just not great. It's the Ming Wall that all the tourists go to in Beijing that gives the great to the Great Wall. And that was built 300 years after Marco came this way. The cover and the inside here for spread are of uh, uh, Jin Shan Ling, which is probably the classic wall picture uh, because you can just see many pieces of it and the towers going way into the distance and so I was there many times looking for the good light. It's not easy to get good light on a wall because of all the pollution now in China but anyway I managed on several occasions to get uh, what I wanted out of it and um, it's called the wild wall this is the wall that's not uh, heavily touristed though I took these pictures uh, almost 10 years ago and now of course uh, who knows if that's true uh, but good uh, landscape photography almost invariably depends on good light the cover and, and the first inside picture are that golden hour that we call magic hour. Uh, I also got some funny pictures because uh, wherever you build a wall they will come that that uh, it's true and uh, because it's a natural tourist draw you would find f 
funny pictures like this one in the desert uh, where somebody is building Great Wall. Of course, it's a Great Wall billboard. He's going to put some sign up there, but it draws attention wherever you go. Um, this first spread is a favorite of mine because that lump there, which looks like nothing, is the Great Wall. And I got this added uh, interest of the camel and a woman uh, sowing uh, seeds, uh, wearing a red coat. Um, and it's just a nice picture with, uh, it's also in the middle of a sandstorm. So you can see this kind of golden color. If you recall the, the footage from the, um, or the, uh, video from the uh, Iraq war. I don't know if you remember those scenes that they shot in, in uh, sandstorms where the whole uh, TV or whatever you're watching it on sort of went brown. Well, that is uh, the case of uh, sandstorms wherever they are, it turns the air kind of this yellow color. And of course the wind's blowing. I got this great expression on that, on that uh, camel's face. So it's a quiet moment. Uh, everybody's just getting up and I'm in the second class sleeper section, what they call the hard seat sleepers. And uh, it, it's, well, I've, I'm now I've shot a lot on Chinese trains actually, because I've been working also on a story on Chinese rails, China rails. And uh, so uh, this is perhaps my first uh, experience riding an overnight train. And it's funny how these stories, one leads to another, but uh, because of this, I ended up pitching a story on China rails, which hopefully you'll see in a, in a, uh, a National Geographic in, uh, coming soon. I also got a chance to visit uh, North Korea on the Yalu River and uh, saw what the river, what the wall looks like in North Korea. And uh, there are a few pictures of that in here. I got to experience Korean culture in China, which is just an odd thing. Uh, but sharing a border, obviously there are a lot of Korean refugees uh, hanging out on that border and uh, got this rare glimpse into North Korea, which also led to a story later down on the line because I ended up doing a story on DMZ, the North-South Korea border, and eventually ended up two times in North Korea. So it's funny how one story indeed leads to another. Beginning to end, well, we took it literally. And uh, as the book says, the Great Wall from the beginning was right there uh, in, on the water uh, in the Bohai Sea. So I went there to shoot and we understood that the best pieces of the wall were not visible, they were underwater. And because of that wall being underwater, there were some great fishing down there. So I went out with fishermen looking for a picture and this next frame of this guy in a homemade wetsuit uh, was a favorite. You know, you never know where the picture's gonna be and so I'm shooting every aspect of it. So I'm shooting uh, he and his wife going out in the boat. Uh, I'm, they're maneuvering around the wall because beneath here is the ruins of the uh, ancient wall and because of those rocks down there it's formed a reef and that's where all the fish are living. This guy was uh, taking shellfish. But it was just that little moment when he was getting into his suit and I could see this his face in the eye and I popped the uh, shot uh, a picture just at that moment and uh, with flash also and got that nice uh, eye uh, looking out from under this wetsuit that made this frame. Uh, so it became uh, 
you know, I, I would I'd be constantly looking for things to put in front of the Great Wall, and um, here I have a, a women's uh, military choir with the communist flag and the wall as a backdrop, and again, I caught a moment when the conductor is at her peak raising her hands, and a click, I have a photograph, and uh, with all these serious at attention um, uh, band members and choir uh, singing with little stools. So anyway, it's a, uh, a, a moment for me. Here's some of the quirky wall. Well, did you know that the wall uh, is part of a reservoir? And of course, uh, to the Chinese, uh, back a number of years ago, the wall meant nothing. It was just a, a pile of stones. And so they would build a reservoir and the water would come up and bury the wall. And so I'm standing on it, looking into the water where it goes down, where it's been um, where it's under 30, 40, 50 feet of water, and you can see in the background as it comes out of the water and goes up and crests the next hill. So uh, that's Panjako, and I spent a good deal of time there, and the same thing, the best fishing happens to be on top of the wall where it's formed sort of reefs where the fish like to hang out. And so with very subtle uh, glimpses of the wall here are just a little tower you know you're at the wall but <laughs> you can't see it because it's down there uh, a lot of feet below the surface and therefore fishermen became my fair game and again I'm trying to put the wall most of the time in the background I was, it, it, it was a challenge to always be relating whatever the subject was to the wall and so uh, I'm looking for a, in, in most cases, a very subtle reference somehow to that wall. Um, great light, um, Pondrico Reservoir, looking at two pieces of the wall. Okay, so this wall's been photographed a billion times, but I'll bet you didn't know that was the wall. That's what it, the story became, and that's the way I shot it, was to, uh, give people surprises. And to add some life, we I shot the Great Wall Marathon, which is like the Great Wall walk, because it's so tough that uh, people end up walking most of the time rather than uh, running up that wall. And so I have some pictures. Because okay, so you have to have to imagine me having to climb the wall in front of these guys uh, so, uh, one of the side uh, benefits to the story is I was in the best shape I've ever been in my life because I was doing nothing but up and down, up and down these uh, amazingly uh, difficult stretches, steep uh, stretches of the wall with very uh, large uh, steps to negotiate. If I wasn't in shape before, I can tell you at the end of the story, I was in major league good shape and uh, okay then there's tourist wall so uh, doing the best I can to make pictures that are different shooting in good light um, this particular frame of uh, fall where light is just striking one section is a favorite of mine uh, hard to get color into this story because it's not let's face it, the wall was built as a barrier between the frontier which was Mongolia and grassland and the uh, interior inside of course the wall was China and the where lands were irrigated and um, there was farming so we are on the frontier and therefore there is not a lot of trees there's not other than a mountainous brown landscape hard to find that color so uh, for me to get color out of this little stretch of uh, fall uh, foliage um, makes it a favorite of mine. And then the quirky moment. So <laughs> I'm here at a uh, uh, ski uh, resort 
the one and only ski resort outside of Beijing. And uh, people are, it was hilarious because people couldn't stand up on skis. The Chinese don't know, you know, it's the one and only, uh, one of the first ski resorts in China and people are unfamiliar with this sport. So most of them were just falling all over the place. And uh, so that was my job was to find, make a funny picture which um, I think I succeeded by finding this overdressed young lady walking her dog, uh, laden with cameras and little, uh, what is that, a cell phone uh, case or something with a little bear on it, shades, you know, the height of fashion and all these uh, sk uh, skiers with the wall in the background. <laughs> And uh, one of the big highlights for me was uh, the safari park where uh, for, I think it was about $5, it was $5 for chicken, 30 for a sheep. But uh, you could actually buy these animals and have the park people feed them to the lions. And this was a big tourist attraction because the tourists would be all in a bus waiting to see the lions being fed and they'd all paid money to uh, see them being uh, eating chickens <laughs> and uh, 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 sheep live which of course uh, some might think is a little bit on the cruel side or it's like gladiators or you know where, where they were feeding in that case, humans to the lions, but not that drastic. But anyway, you get the idea. And this picture is probably the best picture uh, of the wall, and it's from the tourist wall. And I, uh, I can tell you that the best pictures are made by uh, disregarding the rules. And so in order to get here, I had to jump over the fence, uh, climb the wall uh, all in the dark to be there before the sunrise in order to catch this picture because this part of the wall which is the most photogenic happens to be the tourist wall so if I got there an hour or two later uh, it'd be overrun with tourists and you wouldn't get this great light or this empty wall um, so uh, I see the I, I like to say the best photographs of the wall require agility and stamina because you need the agility to jump over the wall and the stamina to get to the top of the hill in order to shoot this before all the tourists arrive as well so it takes more than just photographic skill uh, we paid our um, admission fees on the way out In a story like this, I'm still looking for a way to involve people. And uh, I was there for Chinese New Year's and discovered that right uh, next to the wall, they would be having uh, Chinese opera uh, performances under the wall. And so I was here to shoot. In Mongolia, uh, this non-picture, I guess you're going to say, this uh, kind of uh, S pattern, that's about all I can have, say about it photogenic, photographically, is, is the wall. And it makes sense because it's the hardest place since it once was the Great Wall and all that brick or whatever, the mound of, of uh, mud that was the wall is now worn down and because it's the hardest area they've made it the road and so the road runs over the root of the great wall so then i started looking for odd situations in this case someone whose house uh, has become or the, the, the wall has become part of somebody's house. And there were numerous uh, places where I found this situation where, again, because it's pounded earth, people either used it as a wall of the house or the 
with a burl inside it and make it a room of some sort. So there were many odd kind of um, living uh, situations uh, connected with Gray Wall, which uh, allowed me also to shoot people subjects. And of course the Mongolians. So I spent time in Inner Mongolia looking for the um, descendants of uh, Genghis Khan for uh, who th the wall was supposed to keep out of China. So um, I got to wander around in Inner Mongolia and shoot scenes like this. It's not easy anymore to find uh, large herds of horses. We lucked out in finding one, but uh, what's happening there is the uh, climate change has uh, created some uh, droughts that have killed off large numbers of the horses that used to be uh, part of um, Mongolia and of course the Mongolian lifestyle. on horses could really uh, cover ground over this flat land. Favorite picture? Uh, this is a town along the wall and I love the atmosphere. It's coal smoke, it's polluted and pollution makes good pictures is all I gotta say and I got this I was there early in the morning, and uh, I got these, uh, this scene of a, a silhouette of a bike rider and, and um, two gentlemen walking through the town in early morning light with uh, pollution and coal smoke emanating from all the kitchens, giving this great atmosphere. <laughs> My best moments on this were the people, and as, as typical, it's the people that you meet. So uh, I have a bunch of series of pictures of people living in the wall, which uh, they claim was the, the best of all worlds, and that is warm in the winter and uh, cold, cool in the summer, where they've taken the wall and burrowed in there. And again, because of the fact that it's the hardest uh, uh, material since it's been pounded earth, uh, they could live very comfortably inside this uh, wall and be, feel very, of course, protected and uh, warm by uh, uh, living in this makeshift cave house inside the wall. Yeah, a lot of the towns, uh, the wall uh, outside of, to the west of Beijing actually becomes a series of fortified towns. It's not a continuous wall. And uh, you would get to these, uh, which is why it was never that effective. I mean, the, the wall around Beijing, uh, where there were mountains, uh, was extensive and uh, hard to build because it was up and down hills. But the main thing is, uh, why would you attack that if it was so difficult the terrain as well as the, the height of the wall when you could just go further west and just 
drive through there with your horses because the wall was was pretty flat and it was just uh, uh, defensive towns that uh, uh, kept people kept kept the Mongols at bay. So they never a actually challenged Beijing's walls; they just went around them. But yeah, you'll see a series of pictures of people living in. Uh, walls and some of that uh, character of the wall out there, which is pretty uh, <laughs> a lot different from anybody's idea of what the Great Wall is, because we're all conditioned to seeing that one around Beijing. Um, I shot this. Uh, this is a favorite picture. It shows you how. Again, you have to think of this as the wall is the frontier. So you're talking about people right on the edge. We're talking about not the main sector of society. We're talking about people who are probably the descendants of the guards who lived on the wall back in the 15th and 16th century. And here uh, they are just on the edge of the area that is cultivatable. You see these uh, hot houses and they're very ingenious in that they take what they have which is rice straw in this case that they collect in the summer and they use these as mats or wheat straw I'm not sure what it is but they use these as mats to cover these plastic houses at night and then in the morning they roll them up and let the light and sun in and therefore uh, and, and the warmth in to, to grow their crops at night time they're taking them down. Yeah, as I was mentioning, I was here at New Year's looking for festivals, looking for anything. Uh, for an assignment like this, as long as the wall is visible, whatever the subject is, fair game. So I would roll into village that was right next to the wall and uh, find something to do there. So, um, and out here in the middle of, of uh, um, in Gansu, where these next pictures are taken in the footsteps of Marco Polo. So these pictures are of um, this area that Marco Polo commented on and failed to mention the wall, which is why uh, many people think he never went to China because he never mentioned the Great Wall. Well, the reason why he never mentioned the Great Wall, if you look at it, it's just not great. But what was impressive, again, were the fact that all this action happens in the middle of nowhere where they, and, and they keep the tradition. So uh, at uh, New Year's, they, uh, each village dresses up and parades to the next as part of their New Year celebration. So, of course, I was there to shoot this um, uh, small town, their small village celebration as, uh, as this uh, um, parade enters, uh, goes from one village to the next, and um, got this photograph. Who would have thought that it's a tradition to jump over a fire if you're <laughs> to welcome in the new year. I found this one village where the wall runs through the village and acts as the back wall to a bunch of animal pens um, in a place called Shaco. And when I first saw this, I thought, Yes, this is going to make a great picture because, again, uh, in this part of China, the wall was forgotten. Nobody cared about it. It wasn't that tourists are coming there. They just used it for whatever they could. In this case, made a great sheep pen wall. And uh, so they cut a hole through, they cut a door, they, they'd make a door and cut a hole through the wall. And through that door, they would, uh, the sheep were, would come in and out for, during the day or night. And uh, so I was there the next morning. I climbed, I, I immediately uh, saw my picture. I, I often say that uh, the best pictures you see here before uh, you, you, the idea comes before you put it on film. You got to see the photograph in your mind's eye before you put it 
on camera. And of course, we ran this in the magazine, two pages. This is it, end of the Great Wall. No way to go this way. No way to go that way either with the mountains. Marco Polo had to have passed through here as all everybody did coming into China from the west. Scale is uh, meaningful to show the scale and the size of the wall. I have, uh, this is the end of the Great Wall and I have a picture of uh, that just has a little bit of a tower and a bunch of people at the top so it gives you a sense of how uh, big and vast the landscape is. Uh, the end of the Great Ming Wall um, as uh, it hits a river in uh, Gansu province. Building the wall, of course, geographic believes in uh, turning over every rock in order to make a picture. And so uh, I found people still build, building wall in order to attract tourists, but using the same methods as they would have done uh, back in uh, the 15th, 16th century. So here they are using these uh, stone implements to pound the earth. Um, I've got my camera right on the bottom, or right on the ground. Well, in, in this case, the wall is already up three or four feet. So I'm uh, basically, I saw this angle as the best uh, one for showing uh, what was being done as they rhythmically move along the wall, pounding it. So every time he'd raise his, his stone implement, I'd shoot in order to capture uh, what was else was going around in the background. It's a uh, it's a point picture, but uh, it's meaningful, and I uh, remember thinking again about it very, very much how I was going to illustrate that, and this became it. It's an unusual uh, way to see things at uh, at sneaker height. And Great Wall Bricks, we, uh, you know, since they're building the new the wall again, there has to be Great Wall Bricks. So we went to the one and only kiln that we could find, which was producing the walls to rebuild uh, tourist wall here and there in China. And I got lucky and happened to be there when they were just opening it up, opening the kiln up, so you can see all these bricks and shot straight down on them. Uh, made this frame which is graphic and um, and colorful and interesting in it and again just waiting for the moment where in this case two guys are handing bricks off to one another. Odd thing in China they take a piece in this case we're in the middle of the desert yet they decide to build a fence around this old piece of wall that's kind of fallen over so uh, wall as a uh, caged animal. They put it in a little cage so people could take a picture of it and not get up close. So um, I shot it that way as if it was, you know, you, you look at this and go like, why would anybody want to take a picture of that in the first place? Yeah, anyway, here's, a, here's a, uh, again, waiting, waiting to make a moment out of nothing. In this case, uh, Muslim women in um, Aksay, and the, the irony is these were the same people that the wall was to keep out, and now they live inside the wall. Uh, and I uh, happened to be at a funeral, and I'm sitting down in the midst of these women as they're feeding me all this food here. And occasionally they would uh, uh, take a break from eating and, and pray. In this case, uh, funeral, this was the second year of a death in the family, and they were honoring this person who died by uh, having this ceremony inside a yurt. Uh, they're Cossacks, and uh, <laughs> anyway, it was an oddity to be uh, shooting the same minorities uh, who, who the wall was supposed to keep out, only they're now living on the inside. So here we are now in Aksay, on the edge of the desert, 
and we've run into these nomadic people or former nomads. They're Kazakhs, and would you believe it, it's a wedding. As I often say, photographers are paid to be lucky. Okay, so this is the this is the uh, the bride being brought to the groom's neighborhood, and uh, she just got off the car. She doesn't have her full getup on, but boy, does she look great wearing red. Can't believe it. The groom's coming in to meet the family. Everybody's welcome. Him. Look at all the guests. Look at these babes. Look at these women wearing these incredibly colorful dresses. This must be the bride's mother. They don't even need music to dance here. <laughs> All right. I don't know what rhythm these ladies are dancing to, but I don't hear any music. And my final frame was of a Chinese woman marrying a Mongolian. And uh, we thought this was uh, very, uh, this was perfect to end the story on because again, full circle where the wall, uh, which was built to keep out the Mongolians by the Chinese. And now it's Mongolia that is more prosperous, at least up there in the border region. It's the area where it has all the uh, minerals and uh, all the new uh, um, building and manufacturing is happening on the Mongolian side. And uh, here we are f uh, photographing a wedding, a Mongolian style wedding on the China side and the bride is Mongolian and the guy is, the groom is Chinese and of course they're going through that drinking game and uh, of course the Mongolians are heavy drinkers and quite strong as and, and the Chinese aren't. So I had this uh, scene where they're pretty much forcing liquor on the uh, Mao Tai, uh, a very strong uh, Chinese liquor on these poor, uh, getting the revenge on the Han Chinese. The easy picture is the wall itself, and of course millions of pictures exist of that wall, especially around the, the Ming Wall around Beijing, but the challenge and uh, difficult part of this story is to bring the human interest, bring something of history uh, to a modern day audience uh, which, you know, a few pictures of the wall is not going to satisfy a reader in the National Geographic. And uh, the story is really about these uh, ancestors of those soldiers who lived and worked on the wall who are living in that same area now and what are they doing and became a story about the one of the poorest parts of China and how these people are coping and how they're making a living and what their lifestyle is. You know, I've got now a kind of a history uh, of recreating historic um, things that don't exist anymore. And stories that are based on history and trying to find something to illustrate that history in, uh, you know, 500 years later. And um, so it's become quite common to me to be uh, working on this kind of story. And uh, the challenge and the interesting part 
is the fact that there is so much living history in China where you can find uh, direct connections to the past, whether it's how they're still living, which hasn't changed much in 500 years. If there's any country in the world that you can do it, it's China. Making a great picture makes my day, and of course, uh, in the days of film, which what this was, you didn't know that, but you'd have a feeling if you had, you had a good day according to how many roles you exposed, because if you were shooting a lot, you figured you must have been onto something, and your eye's not going to fail you, so if you were shooting a lot, you're doing your job, you're seeing something, and you're putting it on film, so that would be a great day. And there are certain pictures in here where I knew I had something special because the subject was great or the light was great or something elevated that situation to make it a great uh, photo op. Most of these books are about bringing history uh, to, to life and uh, yeah, my uh, focus as a storyteller has been again to take these iconic stories which are now familiar to me and bring them to a bigger audience so uh, you know I was telling you about my uh, anxiety about getting a China visa every year because I don't know if they're gonna allow me to come back into the country or not depending on what project that I've just worked on that may may or may not like but I would think that they would want to invite me because I believe that through these books I've given uh, the world a pretty good uh, told a lot of stories about uh, history and periods of China that uh, wouldn't be known otherwise. So I've been doing this for about, oh, well, I can tell you exactly uh, 31 years through uh, from my first trip to China in 1982. And um, yeah, I've been documenting uh, this uh, country and the growth of China. Uh, I, I think this body of work is pretty much the history of China uh, in the last 30 years and, and by indeed focusing on history um, by focusing on history that collection becomes even more important in that you are taking familiar things of China and uh, shooting around those subjects of as they are now and therefore you have a historical record that's pretty much second to none.